in Buffalo, New York, uh, which is really where our party started, and workers were, comrades were uh, in Westinghouse and Steel and were waitresses, were domestic workers. Um, and there was the big, at the time, uh, there were the big blast furnaces, the big steel plants, as many as 20,000 workers. And one of the leading trade unionists in the Lackawanna plant was one of the founders of Workers' World Party named Vince Copeland. <laughs> Um, the, a most amazing revolutionary in every aspect of his life and a steel worker who at one time when he got fired the whole plant walked out in his support. But in his own modest little way he wrote a very small little pamphlet which I recommend we have here called Blast Furnace Brothers. And in it he doesn't dwell on the huge big little steel strikes, big steel strikes and he, even that or what happened in the walkout, and so on. He talks about their fight to bring black workers into the repair crews. The fight to get black workers, who were the most militant leaders of the struggle to unionize, were still segregated on the workplace with mostly black workers in the furnaces which were the hardest jobs, incredibly hard jobs, and all white crews that would be working in the repair crews, also a very hard job. You know, these steel mills were nothing to, you know, take lightly. These were very noisy, hot, dangerous places to work. But for the blast work, blast furnace workers, it was much more so. And I'm not going to get into the details about it because I want you to read the book which I think shows the evolution. But to say that because of the work that Comrade Vinny did, along with others, because of class consciousness, they finally led a struggle and were able to get black workers into the repair gangs. What was the result of that? Of that struggle, successful struggle, which was waged and which Vinny had to put up, he doesn't say it's him in here, but it's him in here. They call him Jimmy in here, but it's not Jimmy, it's Vinny. And he had to put up with threats to his life, threats by the company, and a lot of stuff. This is not, you mess with the racism of the company and some of their stooges. You, it, you're serious business. But he wouldn't back down and was able to win over because he was also an excellent union steward on the repair gang representing the workers. And when a little while after this uh, was successfully done by getting a black worker in, they went on to have a strike over a grievance in repair. You know, as Joyce just asked me what year was this, and I don't know specifically what year, but to put it in context, I think it was in the 50s prior to the big, you know, what we think of as the civil rights movement, there was a lot of stuff going on, even before World War II. And there were, a lot of workers came back from World War II more radicalized and so on, but it, I can't, I don't, I try, I can't, I don't know the exact year it took place. 50, when? 53, thanks. 53, I can, so give you a picture. And they, all the workers, there was a big, um, an important grievance, not the biggest grievance in the world, in the repair gang. And as a result of the repair gang and most of the white workers being won over to defending the right of black workers to be in the repair gang, when they had a big grievance, the blast furnace walked out. You can't run a steel mill. And the whole plant was shut down. So. It showed that, what if they had taken a different approach? Oh well, we'll wait, see, just wait. The time isn't right and so on. But that's not what we do. What, what we do is push it. We know what's right. Push it, try to figure it out, try to do it in the face of opposition and push it. Push forward. Push forward on everything, including what needs to be done now. Similarly, in the phone company, 
well, I was a telephone operator. Um, we we pushed for the first national and won the first national affirmative action in the entire United States. And we did this not by relying on the government. We did this by intervening as workers ourselves, telephone operators, women, majority black. And we won, and this was a huge thing, and many comrades were involved in it. It wasn't just the workers. I mean, the whole party was involved in supporting this struggle. And we later went on to become the organizers of the operators getting into this communication workers. There was a, comp a real company union at the time. And uh, later on to become, that laid the basis for the eventual unionization of all the telephone operators in New York State. But I do want to point out that, and, and, and we shouldn't forget that it was our party that won that, really was our party, based on organizing the workers themselves I mean, they try to have hearings on all this stuff somewhere, and they wouldn't tell us about it even though legally we had the right to know, and we would get in a car in the middle of the night, and we would come flying down to Washington, D.C., and we would disrupt the whole hearings. We'd had demonstrations. Maybe some kind of remember the role that the workers played in intervening in and not leaving it up to any liberal forces to do this, but the power of the workers themselves. But high technology was marching on the phone company. and. We, as the, as we, which had a big base among the telephone operators, we could see that this automation was going to destroy the jobs of thousands of telephone operators. We knew it. And even though, oh, let me forget that because not enough time. So one of the things that they did was they started to charge for directory assistance. Okay, it doesn't seem like a union issue, does it? Well, we knew it was. First of all, we felt it was unfair to the consumers. We had already demanded the right of telephone operators to speak Spanish. You pay your dime, you get a dime's worth. I don't care what language you do it in. This is discrimination, and we supported that, and many other things. So we went to the hearings where they were going to charge, where they were, had hearings around charging for directory assistance. And we had a lot of telephone operators there, and we got up to speak. And we said, we posed it totally. We knew the handwriting was on the wall, what would happen. Plus the automated equipment that was coming in, in not only directory assistance, but also in the, what was called the toll side, the zero, which doesn't exist anymore, and so on at all. We used to plug things in, used to plug, well, I'm not talking about rotary, it was called, you know, it was the traffic department, and one was in directory assistance, and one was called toll. And we knew it. So we spoke. Lots of workers got up and spoke, and I got up and spoke. And the president of the Communication Workers of America, Morty Barr, who later went on to become the international head of the CWA, wrote a letter to the Public Service Commission stating that Gabrielle Jammer and the telephone operators who spoke do, are not speaking for the communication workers of America. We, we need to know this. We had at the time 18,000 telephone operators in New York State. See. Technology destroyed it. I don't, I'm down to about two or 3,000 workers at this point in the entire state. We tried to point out to the union, to the CWA, that we had to unite with the community and we had to fight to de make demands that would save our jobs. And the CWA and the communication workers, whether they're in Verizon or AT&T, or in any of the other companies that have spun off and then remerge, and all of which was to deregulate and attack the unions and so on, have faced tens of thousands of layoffs and has made it difficult to unionize some of the newer companies because of this problem. 